Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero episode, and I'm excited to talk with Matthew Latham, who's the engineering manager at Trim. Welcome, Matthew. Good morning. Nice to be here. Man, how you doing today, buddy? Doing well, doing well. It's a bright, sunshiny day outside. A little bit of fall in the air. Yeah, I, I love this time of year. It's a wonderful time of year, no doubt about it, and very excited to talk with you. And I was even more excited to find out before we started recording that, you know, you actually work right down the road from where I live. So I'm going to have to actually come see you. I, I did not make that connection until right before. So pretty excited about that, man. Yeah, absolutely. One of the benefits of uh, living and working in the Raleigh area is not just, you know, Raleigh city proper, but, you know, everybody hears about RTP, but there's a lot of places in the surrounding uh, little cities and towns. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we love to get these episodes kicked off with just a little bit about your journey to, to the role that you're in now. Absolutely. So my journey to this role started way back when I graduated high school and then joined the Navy. I went in for uh, electronics and was working as a technician on some pretty sophisticated equipment and, you know, thought I knew a thing or two as a, as a young kid. But when I saw those engineers come in and saw problems that we weren't even close to figuring out, it was like a light bulb went off. And I said to myself, I want to I want to be one of those guys. So after I got out of the Navy, I set out to become an engineer. And in order to get your degree while working full time, you got to do night classes, you got to do online correspondence courses and stuff. So I had to do that in order to get my uh, electronics and engineering degree. Then from there, while I was working at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base as the project engineering manager for energy efficiency, I saw a lot of what the decision makers were able to do. And I had a really good experience with a manager that made me kind of really want to be a manager myself. And to take my career to the next level, I then took a moment to recollect myself and go back to school and get my master's in engineering management. Uh, Did that while I was working at Eaton. And while I was there, I learned a lot of supervisory skills really brought myself to another level of management. And then I got my opportunity with Trim to, you know, cut my teeth as a manager, take me in and be more of a contributing factor with them and really just head up a a fairly diverse team. So I really add a lot to the experience that I was able to bring uh, with me along the way. No doubt. I mean, first of all, thank you for your service with the Navy. That's great. You're absolutely welcome. Yeah, absolutely. And love the story. So you worked at Eaton as well. So the Eaton locations, were they local in North Carolina or elsewhere? Yeah, the Eaton locations were here in the Raleigh area. And I worked in the validation lab as well as in the uh, applications and project management group there. You know, I have a fairly diverse engineering background. I've done testing, UL compliance, energy efficiency, validation, applications, engineering, project management. It seems in a lot of ways, people hear engineer and they kind of think, you know, electrical is all electrical, everything, um, mechanical or civil, you know, or, or the like. But in every aspect of engineering, there's so many other sub areas of responsibility that you have to become responsible for as your career progresses. Where did you go to school at, Matthew? I went to school at Old Dominion University. Had you, uh, not sure if anybody else has heard of them. They're fairly popular in the the Norfolk area, and they're pretty well represented with the military. They're pretty military friendly and will provide professors even on board ship while you're out to sea. Now, Matthew, I I bet you did not realize this, but you're talking to a monarch. No way. Yeah, man. You're a monarch? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. (laughs) Graduated in 03. uh, Go old D. That's Absolutely. it. That's it. So we uh <laughs> we have we have a lot in common. Some red thread there. But yeah, I did two years community college for my just the basic stuff, and then I transferred to ODU and lived on campus. Well, just right outside of campus for two years, and did my 
you know, my undergrad work. And uh, so, yeah, great times at Old Dominion, great college. So did you do, were you on campus or did you go through the virtual? How, how'd you do it? I did virtual. I did correspondence. I did community college. You know, at the time, Uncle Sam gives you enough money to go to school, but he doesn't give you enough money to feed and, you know, clothe a family while going to school. So I had to make things work how they how they could. Um, right. Did you know? I also did community college here, at Wake Tech, to, you know, to help supplement some of the classes and just get things done. But yeah, I mean, you got to get there one way or the other, right? No doubt. I mean, the campus is. You're right. It's a heavy military campus right there at the Navy base. And I remember in the engineering classes that I was in, it was it was very heavily populated with Navy, and that that was awesome. Those guys brought a level of experience that I didn't have as a you know, 19 year old kid. Uh, but they were also fun to hang out with outside of class, just a fun group of, uh, just a fun environment, I guess you would say. So yes, that's cool, man. I did not know we had that common thread there. So, uh, we'll have to get around and watch a, a ODU football game eventually. Absolutely. That would sound fantastic. Yeah, I totally agree. When we had classes at Old Dominion, one of the things I really loved about it was that it wasn't just what you were learning in the book. It wasn't just the theory. It was application. There was a lot of real world experience that came out of there. No doubt. Absolutely. Speaking of real world experience, you've been out, you've, you worked in Eaton, you worked in trim, you've got, you know, many different roles from an engineering standpoint. So I'd love to get your take on this. You know, what are you seeing as some of the greatest challenges out there in industry? I'd say the boomers are retiring. That is the, the greatest challenge. This is like peak time for the the baby boomers to retire. They are all in management, vice president, associate vice president, executive roles. And if they are working in the field still, then those that are apprenticing under them are going to have a time because they're going to be gone. They're leaving the workforce and, and they're heading out. In many of the roles that I'm looking at now, the common discussion is what are we going to do when such and such retires? And you've got that decision to make this year, next year, and, and in the next five years, I think it's going to hit the peak of uh, boomers retiring from industry. No doubt. I mean, we're, we're hearing that across the board, Matthew. It's not just you, that workforce attrition. It's happening. It's real. I mean, I'm curious, any programs out there to, at TRIM to, to address that directly? Well, programs for it are going to always fall under apprenticeship. And under the attrition, you're kind of in a catch-22. You got somebody that's been there for a a good while. They know between their experience, either at that company or elsewhere, they've got a lot with them. You don't want to let them go sooner, but you don't want to keep all of that information and have them just walk out one day with it. So in a lot of ways, it's apprenticing, bringing in a little bit more of a lean chain of command where you have a manager slash then a supervisor rather than manager and supervisor give somebody else a little bit of that exposure at the role. And at Trim in particular, one of the things they did was they hired a younger guy like me who's fresh into the management role and said, look, we understand that you're going to manage. I work with some other directors that are older and going to be retiring soon. And, you know, I'd love the opportunity to be able to continue to expand my knowledge and skill set and work with a team and get to a director level and, you know, I think that by the time we get there, we're going to be looking at those guys leading those those roles. Right. I mean, how about like a, a mentor type program or, or mentee where, you know, where you're bringing in people and you're working directly with them? Are you are you finding opportunities to do things like that to you know bring up that next level? It's interesting you say that we are working on the internships, which is kind of like the, you know, the new generation coming into the workforce. And I think it would be a good idea to have a little bit more mentorship at the higher levels. It just doesn't seem to be available right now, especially with everything working so lean. Right. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you you walking us through that. How about the the role you're in as the engineering manager outside of the attrition? What's what's challenging you right now in, in your particular role? The biggest challenge that I'm encountering with my role right now is the vast number of hats that everybody in our department has to wear. I'm over quality engineering, IT, uh, design engineering, and manufacturing engineering. And in each of these, you know, sort of major areas, 
the personnel are having to continually collaborate with each other and go over both mechanical and electrical uh, design challenges, as well as the manufacturing challenges associated with those, uh, the quality issues that we have coming up, as well as trying to make the quality issues a little bit more, you know, plug and play or automagic data uh, coming through so that we don't have as much human input needed in order to analyze the metadata. Can it be difficult sometimes to find a good balance in, in your work schedule? Is that, what, is that a challenge? Yes, it's quite a large challenge to understand and make time for each of the groups. You have a design project come through and it kind of eats everybody's lunch. You still got quality issues to deal with. You still got manufacturing concerns. And it's kind of hard to make sure that you can make time for every person there. Uh, and at the same time, you want to continue to develop the team as a whole. Right. Absolutely. So I guess if you had that magic wand out there, Matthew, and you could you know, put you in a spot where you're doing what you're meant to be doing, right? Uh, what would those areas be that you'd like to fix? Biggest magic wand moment, more hours in a day. If I, if I could get more hours in a day, we might could get there. Or if we could have more people uh, available for it, um, that might would be able to, to help. But even then, when you get more people in, you're going to need more hours in the day to get them trained up and get them up to speed in, in the company. It's a wonderful problem to have, to need more time and to be very busy. No doubt. I mean, I think everybody listening can, can feel you when it comes to the number of hours and resources, you know, it's just, it's, absolutely. it's just never <laughs> enough, you know? I mean, never. And as soon as you find them, there's going to be more work to have for the resources that you get, are able to get a hold of. That's right. So, I mean, part of the hope behind the podcast and these hero episodes are to encourage people and, and to inspire people to come to manufacturing, to come to engineering, because it is a great opportunity to grow. So, for the people that may be listening who are who are teetering, what's some advice you'd give them to uh, pursue a career like yourself? You know, one of the things that I really have enjoyed the most about the manufacturing side is it's a bit of work hard, play hard in the manufacturing realm. You can kind of cut up a little bit. You you know, people will uh, express their real feelings over over items, and we all get it. We're all on the same team when you're challenged with manufacturing difficulties or deadlines and the like. There's very little animosity between folks in manufacturing. It's very much a family atmosphere, a team atmosphere. And, you know, in a lot of ways, you realize that this is similar to in the Navy. Everybody's on the same ship. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I, I love this question too, since you brought that, that work hard, play hard. And I mean, I typically don't think of that when I think of manufacturing. So, Maybe there's some other myths. If you have a chance to debunk some myths when it comes to manufacturing, what would they be? Uh, the biggest myth I would like to debunk from manufacturing is that it's just work you to the bone every day. There is that work hard mentality in manufacturing. And I think that along with that, people don't really see the level of accomplishment that you get from getting a lot of this stuff done. It can be a challenge. It's always has an opportunity for improvement. Manufacturing is continuously improving to the point where, you know, opportunities for improvement can be its own department within the manufacturing world. And yeah, I think that that it's just repetitive. Sort of the Ford Model T car manufacturing image is what a lot of people have come to mind. They're not really looking at how many improvements came to be that made the Ford Model T manufacturing a possibility. Right. Well, how about the environment itself? You know, I've, I've talked to several guests and they've talked about, well, you always think about manufacturing as hot and dirty and nasty. And I remember one guest, she was like, you know, some of the plants I've been in, you could eat off the floor, you know, and it's, it's not that environment at all. Could you speak to that? Absolutely. Uh, manufacturing floors and especially with the, uh, Six Sigma practices that are in place, everything has to be clean. The desk has to be clean at, at the break. The desk has to be clean at the end of the day. The floors are cleaned continuously. Uh, there are certain areas where, yeah, you can absolutely eat off the floor and the flooring is immaculate. The practices are always very clean. In some cases, you think of people going home with dirt under their nails continuously. 
PPE in place and, and there's a lot of practices in place that do as much cleaning as they do working in some cases. No doubt. And, you know, I've thought in the past, Matthew, about bringing home a 5S form for my daughters and my wife, but I, I think I want to keep them all happy. So, you know, <laughs> I'll keep that stuff in the plant. But I mean, it, it's to your point. I mean, you can walk in some of these plants, you know, across the country and, and it's just, it's phenomenal. The organization, a place for everything, everything in its place, just the, the cleanliness, you know, behind manufacturing. So I, I just, I love debunking that when we get that chance. Yeah, especially if you get a, a notion of a clean room. Um, I don't know that I would be able to determine much of a difference between a clean room and an operating room. The two are, you end up having to cover yourself from head to toe. Nothing can get into some of these areas, especially with silicon manufacturing and whatnot. It's just completely different. No doubt. No doubt. So, you know, when you're in, in your job, Matthew, and you're, you're doing the things you enjoy to do, feel like, you know, this is, this is why I'm here. What are you doing in those moments? Those are the opportunities for improvement coming to fruition. Those are the moments where we have found a problem, we have drilled it down to its root issues, and we are implementing solutions. And when you see that take hold and you see people say, thank you, thank you for solving this. This has been an issue for I don't even know how long. And to see that gratitude that they have. In a lot of ways, in my opinion, engineering is at its core problem solving. And when you get those opportunities for improvement to come across and you're able to take a hold of them and use the talents on your team and work together and collaborate to find a solution, it's a powerful moment. It's, it's that line drive type moment where you're, you're ready to come back again the next day. No doubt. I mean, I love it. So, I mean, those solutions in action, right? And it's that fulfillment you get from seeing that problem solved because of the work you did to, to figure it out. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So how about a highlight? Anything that you've done in your career that I mean, when you can look back on is like, man, that was just freaking awesome. Major highlight of my career while I was working at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base as the uh, energy engineering program manager um, we, I got the award for excellence and, uh, they don't do it as much in the Navy, but in the air force, they give you coins, large, like commemorative coins for accomplishments in this. And the boss that I had at the time, Brian Joyner, he was a very empowering type of, of manager. And he had us go out and attempt to get this lead platinum built building and it required a level of collaboration across i think nine different departments and i think we had a team of over 12 people working on it and it created femp uh, award for the base and as a result of the collaboration on that i achieved the award for excellence from the united states air force and it's just like it was one of those moments that you just they take the time to publicly appreciate all of the work that you did. And you kind of take that moment. You're like, I didn't even realize that we were accomplishing all of these things. So that is an amazing accomplishment. Yeah. I've got a picture of the coin and uh, I think the FEMP award that the group of uh, the fourth civil engineering squadron, our entire squadron was captured in the lead platinum award. It's one of the only ones in, I think, a couple of years before and after that had a group as the picture. Every one of them had like two or three people as, you know, the, the person's getting the recognition. We strongly felt that we wanted the entire civil engineering department and the civil engineering squadron to be represented with it. Just, you know, talk about a hero episode. <laughs> Folks, we are definitely talking to a hero on this one. So this is that's great, Matthew. Thanks for, for sharing that highlight. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to collaborate with everybody. You had energy, you had the civil engineers, architecture, HVAC, legal had to be involved in it. Yeah, we were able to get a lot of opportunities for improvement recognized in just one building. And I think as a result of that, we were able to take down like seven other buildings that were just old, leaking energy everywhere, had numerous maintenance issues, and co combined them all into a very efficient uh, single building for even 
the personnel on base wouldn't have to go from one building. And then if you get the, the run around, you got to go to another building and another building. Now it's just go to the same single building. No doubt. Absolutely. And again, thank you for sharing that story. And, and Matthew, I want to shift just real quickly on you. I know you, you have a passion for STEM. We have definitely support that and, and have some had some guests on and talked about you know STEM in general. So I know this is important to you. So maybe you can talk to our listeners about some resources that you found helpful, just encouraging that next generation, you know, speaking to the workforce attrition problem that, that you're seeing. What would you tell listeners? One of the biggest things I would tell listeners is to get your kids involved early. First grade is not too early to ensure that you have them prepared for STEM practices in math and sciences. As you and I were talking a little bit earlier, trying to do game night or doing, you know, home experiment night, just doing some of these things for fun and for play at home really allows your kids to see that failure on an experiment is not a bad thing. It's a good thing to be able to learn and that success on an experiment isn't necessarily the goal. To be able to understand an experiment or to be able to explain the problem is really the goal. And interaction with mom and dad in that respect, I think, really sets the stage for what kids that are interested in STEM go through. I myself, I loved taking things apart as a kid, and I primarily loved being able to put them back together and see how they work. When other kids do that, sometimes they break it. And breaking it can lead you to not having the toy anymore. But in some cases, you could just encourage that and say, hey, look, we found out how this doesn't work. And I think that one of the other key things I would suggest is reward the kids for trying. Some kids get it sooner. Some kids get it a little bit later. But all kids can be rewarded for for trying on it, even if they, they don't get it right away. No doubt. So, I mean, just, just to recap, we want to get involved early really be intentional about that interaction and then just being that positive reinforcement for we don't always have to get this right up front. You know, it's the the process, the journey to the end goal is, is where we, we get the, you know, all the knowledge, right? Absolutely. And I think if you look throughout STEM fields, that's the internal fortitude that a person needs to be successful in STEM fields, because as I'm sure we can all relate. There's a lot more failures than there are successes in it. No doubt. I mean, it also gives us a chance if we're intentional about STEM and helping the next generation to to mentor others. Have you found that opportunity yet? Yes. What I did personally was day one in any supervisory or management position, it was my goal to find who my replacement would be within the team. Who's your, who's your number two? and immediately start trying to work with that person, not just in their day-to-day tasks, but in that eventual future. Ensure that you can pave the way for them a little bit and say, hey, you know, what other classes or training or experiences do you need to get to that next level? Allowing your personnel to just come in and do their work day-to-day can leave them feeling like, where are they going to go next? But always talking about the future with them and always talking about those next steps with them, you're going to find the person that's going to be taking over your role. Good point. I mean, and be intentional about working with them and their career so that you can feel good about that opportunity for when you, when you have a chance to take that next step that your backfill will be ready, right? Yeah. You want that backfill ready to take it over immediately because in hopefully a, a good 25 some years or so, I'll be the one retiring and I want the people that are on my team to be ready to take up the reins right away. I love it. Absolutely. So let's get off of work and get off of STEM. Let's talk about you outside of work. So any hobbies or anything you'd like to share with our listeners? I'm a golf and tennis person. I love to go bike riding and whatnot. And and those are, those are great for me, but I got to tell you the major hobby that I've had for the past 13 years is I'm a Y-Guides dad. It's a program around Raleigh. Y-Guides is dads and either sons or daughters. You get together with another group of dads and you go out every month, two times a month, and you do adventures with your kids. Now, that's pretty cool. So these uh, these like camping trips are just like typically all done in yep. one day? 
It's camping trips, it's hiking, it's sporting events, it's craft events, it's rock climbing, it's, you know, whitewater rafting, it's play dates. We did room escapes. We've done horseback riding. We just did a couple of weeks ago, trail riding. And, you know, you're talking experiences that first, second, and third grade kiddos don't really have much of, and you're getting easily 12 to 24 of them in, in a year. No kidding. So what, what's the typical age group for, you know, the kids that are going on these trips? So the Y guides program starts at first grade and goes through third grade. And then from there you can do, I think they call it like trailblazers. And I've been doing that with my oldest daughter, who's currently 15 and really been doing the the trailblazers with her. And that's, you're going out, you're learning how to shoot 22s. You're shooting bow and arrow, you're fishing, you're kayaking, canoeing, scavenger hunts. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's continuous fun for the kids. That is awesome. And what we can do for our listeners, it's just, this is a new topic to me, and I'm so glad we we're talking, Matthew, because I want to investigate this on my own for opportunities for me and my daughters. So we'll go and we'll put a link in our show notes. So you've been doing this, you said, 13 years? Let's see here. I did it since Chloe was in. So 11 years. I've been doing it 11 years. Nice. Nice. Very cool. So thank you for sharing that. And and you mentioned family. So we love to talk on these hero episodes about family. Anything you'd like to share? Yeah, family and that family work-life balance is incredibly important. Taking that time throughout these months, once, twice a month, and just setting that time aside for one kid and i'm sure you deal with it as well you got two kids you got two people trying to get your attention if you set intentional time with them individually that little bit of time can work wonders and it doesn't have to be every day doesn't have to be uh, too often a couple times a month where you just give you know several hours to just one kid to let them know how much you care about them how much you appreciate them have an adventure with them and let them see you in a different light Uh, I think that work-life balance is incredibly important, and it's been a mainstay throughout my career, especially when you walk into work some days and you're like, man, what am I doing? (laughs) Right. Absolutely. It kind of gives you that sense of, you know, of of core of identity. Okay, here's the reason. This is the why. Exactly. So how many many kids do you have? I have two, two daughters. Two daughters, and you mentioned how— 15 and 8, about to turn 9. Fun. So that's yeah. awesome. I have two daughters myself. I have eight and 10. I think you mentioned your oldest daughter's name is Chloe. So is mine. Mm-hmm. So we have the, the old dominion. We have the oldest daughter named Chloe. What else do we have, Matthew? Uh, is your youngest daughter named Sage? <laughs> uh, no, we, we missed on that opportunity, but, uh, <laughs> so we also love on these episodes just to kind of share with our listeners. What do you enjoy for podcasts any YouTube channels, any books, you know, just things out there that you consume, that you enjoy. It could be business or it could just be for fun. Uh, I have a lot of podcasts I listen to just for pure entertainment. Uh, Just curious, anything that you would recommend? Yeah. So my major, the YouTube channel or the one that is a lot of fun for me, and it's not a whole lot of people don't know about it, but it's a, a friend of mine's daughter and her name is Mina. And they do like uh, talking about empowering the kids. This is a fantastic channel to see. It's called Mina makes and it's just her and she makes um, a meal. And usually it's a meal that you and I would never have even heard of or even really be able to make. Uh, She's able to make these in the kitchen and it's, it's really, really kind of cool to see. She's like seven, eight years old and is making these wonderful meals in the kitchen. And it just has an amazing personality with it, explains things fairly simply, uh, and it's just a lot of fun. Now, that's really cool. My 10-year-old, she's the chef in our family, so I'm going to have to check out. So it's Nina Makes, huh? Yeah, M-I-N-A, Nina Makes. And have her watch it. It is a lot of fun. You'll end up having some pretty uh, nifty meals at home. That's for sure. Those are really good meals too. Nice. Definitely. I'll check that out. And we'll, we'll also put that link in our show notes. So thanks for sharing that. I also know you, you love the podcast Eco Ask Why. So we thank you for that, Matthew. <laughs> Absolutely. Eco Ask Why is, is right there at the top of my list. I hear you, buddy. I hear you. So we call it Eco Ask Why. We, we typically end with the why where we get to the purpose. 
you know, if you had to share your personal why, what would that be? Opportunities for improvement. That's what drives me. And it's applied in so many different ways. When I have a conversation with my kids, and, and I'm sure a lot of parents are going through this right now, you're half homeschooling your kids. When it's all said and done and you've gone through the problem, you kind of take a moment and look back on it and say, how could I have made that better? How could I have made that you know, easier on them? How could I have changed it around? It's continuously taking that cycle of improvement and asking yourself at the end, what more could I have done? Always having an eye out for those opportunities to, and to seize them. Sometimes you're not going to be able to. Sometimes it's, it's not going to be there. But, I mean, sometimes it doesn't pan out. But looking at it and finding that that's what drives me on most every given day is how can I make this better? Well, that is awesome. I I think we're all better, Matthew, just by uh, hearing your story and for you sharing it with us. You know, I I appreciate you being so open, honest, and truthful for our listeners. Uh, You definitely have done some tremendous things in your career. It's it's been an honor to talk to you. Thank you again for your service with the Navy, and, and I wish you nothing but the best in the future, sir. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. This was a lot of fun, guys. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.